Hello everyone and welcome to The Real South Africa. I'm your host, Mark Edward Blanton, and this episode right here is a very special episode to us. And the reason why is because we're taking it way back. We're talking about the story that happened before the story. So again, this video right here was very pioneering um, some time ago, but we're gonna bring it to you today and just kind of update it a little bit, but we're gonna, you know, bring it to you because those who have seen it before have been inspired just like us, and we want you to be inspired as well. So go ahead and watch this, this video and welcome to The Real South Africa. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Edward Blanton from The Real South Africa. And what we're doing today is we wanna bring you a special presentation. Now, a lot of you guys have been following us for a while and you know our story and so forth. But before that, there was another story. And it actually started with a, with a video that I saw many, many, many years ago. Um, actually, it was roughly around 2009. It was called Blacks Without Borders, Living the American Dream in South Africa. Now, I will say since we've been doing what we've been doing, bringing you know, great individuals to uh, South Africa, they have, we've had many conversations. And I'm sure you've seen some of the conversations, some of the first impressions that we have done. And a lot of times this video comes up. So I decided to say, you know what? Uh, we all end up saying that we haven't seen it in a long time. Um, it was very inspirational. It started our journey or the journey to say, hey, let me come to South Africa, or at least let's start talking about it. So what I have done, or what I'm going to do, is take this video, I'm gonna cut it in half, because I do have uh, a copy of the video, and I, and, and I wanna just let you, I want you guys to see it too, so it can start, a, start uh, more conversations about coming to South Africa and Africa in general. Now, we all know that this is a grassroots movement, meaning that I'm going to tell you, you're going to tell someone else, and then so on and so on, and then we're going to pass this information on to everyone else. And then, of course, there now is a bridge for you guys to say, okay, I've seen the movie. Um, yeah, it's a little dated, and I, and I will admit that, but we're actually working on some, some more content to uh, update and refresh you know, what is going on here in South Africa. But I will also tell you that the content is, is very relevant, um, and it's still true today. So I think that you need to take a moment and watch this entire video in its entirety. Um, this will be, it'll be part one and then of course there will be part two. So um, we're highly interested in what you think. We would love to hear your comments. Of course, those that are in the diaspora, you're more than willing to leave your comments because we definitely want to hear from you. And of course, those that are South Africans who have never seen this documentary, uh, please leave your comments as well. Um, I think, like I said, it's a grassroots movement between those in the diaspora and then those there here in Africa. Um, and right now I'm fortunate enough to be in Africa. And I'm here simply because, like I said, I saw that video or this video a long time ago. And like I said, it, it made me start thinking about coming to South Africa. Um, and then ultimately I got the, the opportunity to come here to 2010 World Cup and that just changed everything. So that's why I, I want to bring this to you and I'm going to bring it to you. And so enjoy it. You are a person here. You know, you don't have to apologize for being black. The fact that I um, was, was black actually helped me. Imagine affirmative action with teeth. There's no glass ceiling here. James Prevost is here. I was here one year, and believe it or not, I was sitting down having lunch with Mandela. And I didn't have a, a pot to piss in or a winner to throw it out of then. There was an enormous opportunity to do something great here. Uh, something that would be very difficult to accomplish uh, in the States. We are developing a huge mixed-use project along the ocean front near Durban. Around 500 million rand, which is close to 100 million dollars. Something I would never have thought about doing in the United States. Here, it's a new frontier. The opportunities are almost uh, unlimited.
Happy birthday to you. Blow out. Hand up, blow out. My motivation to come to South Africa, bro, was initially political, really trying to be a part of the anti-apartheid struggle. So I had an opportunity to come, do some work, and I took it. So when we talk about lead, leadership, emotional intelligence, and dynamic customer service, we're talking about you. One of the first things I recognized when I got to South Africa was that there was a big need for the work that I do, which to a large extent focuses on helping people to build their self-esteem and confidence to accomplish whatever it is that they're trying to do in life. Did anything stand out for you, Sipo? I echoed my sentiments that uh, I felt like I was made a fool. People of color traditionally uh, Black people, colored people in South Africa have traditionally low self-esteem because of uh, because of the system, because of the political systems of the past. The essence of of the work in terms of bridging the gap between black and South Af black and white South African primarily is really getting people to unpack their past, and that past relates to the apartheid experience. A lot of pain and a lot of anguish has to be dealt with on an emotional level. And in my workshops, people deal with that. So you will often often see people literally breaking down in tears, crying as they speak about experiences from the past. At times I was afraid to talk about it because I feel ashamed of myself. And I think it's, it's the right place to talk about it and hope that after I'll be able to live with it. This course has helped me to build my self-esteem. So at first coming in here, I was very frightened and I couldn't stand up and talk. But now I've, I've, I've built up and I'm strong enough to say whatever I want to say. The, the nature of the program, training program that I'm doing here is really dealing with the, uh, the conflict that has arisen between more senior white managers and a majority black staff. Come on, Sissi. Come on, Danny. Come on, Danny. Right. Listen, the training, I'm going to step up. Just came to check on the training. I'm going to go upstairs in a minute. But I wanted to just talk to you for a minute about okay. how you feel the training is going. We've had instances of managers who came in here and, you know, if you, you have to approach them in a certain way, you know, because they come from a different organization where you respect someone because of their position. And we're saying it's not really because of your position, it's how you interact. You actually earn that respect. If you could imagine managers that are kind of coming from an old school way of, of managing, if you were more hierarchical, and if you look at African culture, which is much more participative, um, there's something called Ubuntu which is really talking about people working together. Um, the, the old hierarchical way of managing doesn't really go over well in the new South Africa. A reality in South Africa is the fact that we come out of cloistered environments, out of silos. And, and if we don't break down some of the, the inhibitions that we have and learn to relate to each other, then we cannot sort of realize our full potential. South African history I don't think is that much different from, from what the black um, African Americans have been through. So he could relate to the issues that we were going through. So for me it was a benefit having someone like Charles Benson run the program for us. My mission in life is to take the things that I have learned in my life and to share that with others in a way that enables them to improve the quality of their lives both personally and professionally. That's my mission. And when I talk about what I have learned in my life, I'm not talk just talking about what I learned at Harvard Business School. I'm talking about what I learned on the corner of Lennox Avenue in Harlem when I was shooting dope at the age of 16. So there's a lot of things that I have learned in my experience that enable me to do what I do. And truth be told, a very small part of it was picked up at Harvard Business School. 
Harlem has a lot of significance in my life because it was here that I got my early education in street life. At the age of 14, 15, I was coming down here with my friends buying drugs, heroin and cocaine. By the time we were 16, we were using it intravenously, being chased by the police, stuck up at gunpoint, stuck up at knife point, uh, incarcerated in the precinct on 135th Street. So yeah, there's a lot of memories, most of them bad. <laughs> Standing here in front of the 32nd Precinct brings back memories of when getting high was no longer fun. I spent the night here for possession of a stolen car. The defining moment for me to get out the life was when the police came knocking on my, on my mother's door at 3 o'clock in the morning on New Year's Eve with a warrant for my arrest. It was at that point that I got the wake-up call and realized that there was no way out. There's obviously a lot of brothers and sisters who have experienced what I've been through and they didn't make it the way I made it. And what I would say to the families and to the friends of those individuals who are struggling today with their drug addiction is don't give up on them. My mother never gave up on me. My grandmother never gave up on me. And that was the strength that I needed to overcome my own drug addiction. I stay because I love it. I love this place, man. I love Africa, and I have really grown to really love South Africa. I love the people, I love the environment, the landscape, the lifestyle, the restaurants, the, the wine country, and I love the fact that I could do the work that I love and have people benefit from that. That's my reward personally, really. I've been able to make my contribution here. I've done it, bro. If I get on a plane tomorrow morning and that plane don't land, I, I have already fulfilled my mission, my purpose in life. So I'm cool. We got some Mark Curry. Who gave me see Mark Curry? I'm about to go on stage right now, so I can't get into my own room. James Prevost is here. <laughs> yeah. What's up, y'all? What's up? I moved here in 95, and at that point, that was one year after the new election, once Mandela took taken over, and it wasn't anything much funny there. I thought that bringing comedy would help heal negative wounds from the past of apartheid. At this point, did black people decide to go from here? I wanted to go to Africa because I didn't think Africa was the way it was being portrayed in the United States. So I decided I want to come and investigate. I came uh, on a trade mission with the then mayor of Atlanta, Bill Campbell. I would say, what was it, 94, 95, uh, there wasn't anything nice being shown about Africa at all. They barely even showed an office building or a house. So now you see different images but the only images we were able to capture back then was the, uh, the jungle, the zebra, the guy running butt naked with a spear. Those are the things that we only had, but I knew there was more to be found. So I came over and to my surprise, it was incredible. And then I moved over. Before I got into comedy, I opened up a nightclub. And the nightclub was the first upscale nightclub in the whole country for blacks. Everyone said it wouldn't last. In the last two years, and it was a great um, launch pad for me to get involved with my comedy. What I wanted to do is just basically create a stand-up comedy industry because there was none here. We in South Africa doing it real major. Oh, it's so major, it's so real, man, it's unbelievable. Big diamonds in your face. If I was doing that commercial, imagine, it'd be like this. Take shampoo and condition it into the shower. No, 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 no. Not me. I just wash, wash, wash again. Rinse, condition, set, wrap, oil, grease, blow, dry, tongue, gel, super oil, gel, extra sheen, extra spritz. Check in the mirror, put more lipstick, check in the mirror again. More sheen, more spritz. More gel, more extra gel, more moisturize. More gel, more extra gel, more sheen, more spritz. Check in the mirror again. Lipstick, check in the mirror again. Then go. <laughs> if it's not raining. Oh! How it is exploding. In the last four years, uh, particularly the black comedy industry has grown over 2,000%. It's growing faster than we imagined, actually. The first show, we had 1,000 people, and 18 months after that, we had almost 4,000 people come out. And this is people who came, never knew stand-up comedy, never even been to see, um, particularly black stand-up comedy. 
I always want to be the first to do something all the time. It's bad in a way because I take, I can take uncalculated risks by doing so, but it's important for me to be first or to make some type of difference. So with comedy now, comedy is it's a new comedy industry that we have developed. And to be in the forefront of creating an entire industry, it's an amazing thing. Your kids can see that you participated in the growth of an industry, which is putting money in numerous people's pockets. Our, our comedians grew from maybe 10 four years ago to now there's probably over 100 black comedians here, good and bad, but um, they're making money. Some of them are getting corporate gigs that pay them you know, nice amount of change. You do see a lot of uh, holes and niche and opportunities that are here in the country. But for the most part, what I did, just transferred exactly what I was doing in the United States. I did the same thing here. I didn't try to do anything different or anything spectacular. Um, I was involved in entertainment in the U.S. and I was in commercial real estate in Atlanta. I was representing a lot of the uh, record labels on commercial real estate in Atlanta because my first love would probably be in properties over entertainment. See that building right there? That building is called Ponte. That building, Nelson Mandela, all your top politicians, anybody who was anybody with any cash had an apartment in that building up to 12, 14 years ago. It was the place to be. Now it's turned into projects. So the city of Johannesburg is going through right now is the same that any major city U.S. has gone through, where the, the inner city becomes dilapidated, wore down, and all your main businesses move north, which is exactly what's happened here. All the businesses moved north and they left the city kind of like abandoned. So now uh, the city has decided they want to claim it back and uh, renovate and bring it back to where it was 10, 15 years ago. I believe in this area so much and which is why I own um, a property portfolio in this area because I want to be part of the turnaround and the uh, regenification of the area because I have so much belief that it will transform back to the middle class one day. San Diego and Hatfield Court are two buildings uh, that I recently purchased. This one here, I just got the letter of approval today on San Diego. Um, the reason being is the, the loan originator for Highfield Court, they told me that, hey, if we give you the money for this building, you have to buy the one next door because the one next door, if, if, if I go and renovate this one to look very nice, it's not gonna help the block because I have one next door to it that is dilapidated. So I made the guy an offer, he accepted it, and now we're going through with the transfer process. This is the apartment when I first got the building. Um, it's still, we still did some repairs, but it gives you a rough state of how, what condition this place was in before we did our renovations. And what I'm going to do is take you downstairs where you can see a complete version after our renovations are done. Okay, here what we have is a completed version of my renovation. Um, upstairs you saw a raw shell as it was when I bought the building, now this is the completed version. We stripped the floors, varnished the floors, and we added ceramic tiles in the kitchen and bathroom, which gives it an upmarket appeal for the young professionals that we're targeting. Hey, we all grew up in a ghetto. It ain't anything we're scared of. And if I can add a, add a hand to the transformation, then, and then it's all for the good. This neighborhood is one of those things that the majority of people in the country don't believe in. I'm betting on black. I'm betting that this is going to turn around and that it'll be a profitable thing uh, in the future for me. In 1996, I was here one year and believe it or not, I was sitting down having lunch with Mandela. And I didn't have a, a, a pot to piss in or a winner to throw it out of then. But I was sitting down having dialogue with the president of the country. Now, can that happen in the U.S.? Probably not. But here in Africa, anything is possible. Women must make strides in Africa in order for Africa to succeed. The continent is overwhelmingly populated with women, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, several of the countries have been in uh, wars for decades. A lot of men have died off uh, as a result of HIV AIDS. It is imperative that women be given the opportunity they have the desire, they have the instinct, they have the intuitiveness uh, to do business and succeed in business on this continent. If 
been making a film called, it's a feature film, an American feature film, it's called The Breed. It's a West Craven production. It's about dogs, vicious, intelligent dogs that um, attack some kids on an island. Hey. That's the fake dog, guys. That's the fake one. <laughs> the film industry in South Africa is, is very wide. I think the, the thing right now is just overcoming the, the, the racial divide because you know, that skills transfer has to take place. And right now, the white people are the ones who have most of those skills. So we just have to make sure that some of those are passed on to black folks. And it's very important for the industry, you know, because in this country, you always hear people saying, oh, there's not enough unit managers, there's not enough line producers, there's not enough this, that, 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 that. And the thing is, is because they're only relying on 20 cents of the population to fill those jobs, you know. Once you start training black folks, it's not going to be a shortage of anybody. <laughs> Jenny, are you ready to die? <laughs> so ready. Okay. It would have been very difficult for me to accomplish the same degree of success in the states that I've been able to accomplish here in South Africa. And that's because my skin color was not a barrier. And in the states it always is. <laughs> yeah. Here, the fact that I um, was, was black actually helped me. You know, and the fact that I had a really good resume when I got here was um, so all that, that mattered actually. So they looked at my resume and they said, wow. You know, this girl has done something. Black filmmakers in the States should should get in touch with filmmakers here. So if they have a project, you know, they should you know, think about coming and shooting it over here. You know, because we've got qualified crew, we've got equipment, and as you'll be able to see from walking around the country, it's beautiful here. <laughs> It'd be really great if we could have um, more of a um, black American and um, black South African kind of skills exchange. I think the, the results would be fabulous. <laughs> I'm a gemologist and a diamond trader. They were not accustomed to seeing women in the diamond business. So the first thing they told me was, no, you're not a gemologist, it's impossible. You can't be a diamond trader. Diamond traders are Orthodox Jewish males. They are not black African-American females. <laughs> I sing in a number of languages, including Hebrew and Yiddish, and the facility with, with uh, the music, Hebrew and Yiddish music, has actually helped me gain entry into the business. In the U.S. consumer market, 25 to 35 percent of the consumers are from the African-American community. Black people love gold. We also have an affinity for Africa and anything that is African and African in style, African in design. And yet, in any major city in the U.S., there is not a place that you can go to to buy African jewelry made of precious metals and gemstones. I saw that as a niche, and that's the niche that I'm developing. So when I opened the jewelry shop, this shop is the prototype for a franchise chain. We're going to do a few more stores in South Africa, and then it's off to America. That gets me back to my family, you see. <laughs> and it also gets the products of these new emerging jewelers and designers into the principal marketplace so that they can then become entrepreneurs and be self-sustaining with their talent and with the design sense that they learned from their ancestors. I used to tell people I was from South Africa. Didn't know anything about it at that time. But I told people my parents were from, from Johannesburg. <laughs> so, I think it was meant to be. Hello, welcome to Lemurian Guest Lodge, located in Houghton, South Africa, which is probably one of the most famous neighborhoods in South Africa because of our very famous neighbor, Nelson Mandela, who lives only two blocks from here. Houghton was founded over 100 years ago by the Jews who were in the gold and diamond business. When they just put in all the gold mines, uh, the gold bearers moved right outside the city and they moved into Houghton and that's where all these big mansions were built. The average stand or lot in, this, in Houghton is one acre. Some are larger and the average house is maybe 10,000 square feet. There are absolutely no blacks in Houghton, but Houghton was curious, it was a, a Jewish area. This house was built in 1938, which is one of the newer houses. 
in how to. I practiced law for 25 years. It started very young. <laughs> I am a very successful law practice, probably one of the most successful black lawyers in uh, Chicago and probably the States. I was easily pulling down a million dollars a year, sometimes much more than that. And it was not hard for me to leave that life, give it up to move to Africa. And people thought I was nuts closing down a law practice like that. My plan was always to practice law until my kids got grown. And once they got grown, I had, well, had planned on stopping. And I always wanted to live in Africa. And I've lived, I've been to like 27 countries in Africa. And South Africa is the first country I've been to that I really felt comfortable in and really felt I could live here. We lived two blocks away and we had Lemurian guest house then. And we bought that place in 99. And then we decided that we wanted to do something different. So we sold that place and we came here and looked at this place. And I looked around and decided it would, be, it would fit what we wanted to do. Of course, my husband looked at it and panicked. <laughs> he just couldn't think of anything this place could be done because it was a wreck. It really was in bad condition. And I decided, oh no, we can do it. And we started out, we're going to do it right. We started out, we're going to hire an architect, hire a contractor. And everybody had these issues. You know, the architect needed, you know, get plans through City Hall. No, this thing, through City Hall, that could take a year. And I was, oh no, <laughs> we can't wait a year to get plans through City Hall. So I said, that's okay. I'll be my own architect, I'll design it. Now this was once an indoor swimming pool. We were getting a lot of calls for meetings and conferences, and we thought we'd get better use out of this room as a conference room. So now we're converting it to an indoor conference room. We have filled the pool and we've put the floor in. And once the floor is in, we're going to put in underfloor heating, then we're going to towel the entire conference room. And once we put in the chandeliers and the draperies, and more windows, then it would be a very beautiful conference room. And it's already booked. It's still, it stays booked, so we've already got four bookings for the conference room. This project took us about five months to do. So in five months, we put in 10 cottages and redid the house. So that means that I had to have crews going on all over the place. I may have had 10 crews working at one time. At first I had a lot of problems because these people were not accustomed to working with women and having women tell them what to do, nor could they believe I knew what I was talking about. So I had to really crack the whip on these guys to get them to do what I wanted to do. But after a while, when they saw how things were going, then they got very cooperative. Now I have no problem at all. When I tell them to do something, they do it because they know it's going to come out right. That maybe this woman really does know what she's talking about. One of the things that sold me on this place was the beautiful trees in, uh, on this property. And Houghton is one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in Johannesburg because of the trees. And one of the things that people may not know is each tree was planted. None of these trees are indigenous. They were all brought here. So it's probably like the largest garden in the world. If this was in Chicago, you're looking at three to four million dollars at least. Well, if you had come in 99, you could have bought this house for $200,000. <laughs> now the price is, is probably doubled, but it's still way under what you would buy in America, because remember we're in probably one of the top neighborhoods in South Africa. We're on an acre of land. We have swimming pools and tennis courts and uh, all, the all the bedrooms got bathrooms and bathrooms are in marble and granite and the kitchen, so you talk about top finishing. Well, a comfortable house in the U.S. I wouldn't be living in. <laughs> I can say that, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> I stay in South Africa because South Africa is home. I feel more comfortable in South Africa than I ever have in the U.S. And so the people are very receptive, very warm. I mean, you're treated, you are a person here. You know, you don't have to apologize for being black like you do in America. You're, you're at home in South Africa. So other than my children who are still in the U.S., you know, there's nothing in the U.S. I miss. We're going into Soweto, and what you're going to see today is what most tourists don't see. We're actually going to see young people. Most of them are orphaned or vulnerable because of the HIV-AIDS pandemic. 
It is a Saturday morning and the kids will be there working hard on their academics and life skills so that they can move out of the cycle of poverty. This road divides the color township from the African township, the Soweto. This is a colored township here. And a lot of the Africans have moved over to this side, but you won't see the, the colored people moving to uh, the Soweto side. Psychology of oppression and apartheid classified people into different categories, and some colored still feel that they're better than blacks. And now they're upset because with a, a black government, they feel that they're still not getting their fair share of the pie. The Reto stands for a Southwestern Township Chips, and um, there are about four to five million people living here. We're going into Dubé, which is one of the older townships of Soweto. A lot of the prominent figures from the um, struggle movement uh, live, like Mandela and Sisulu. When you look at the, the demographics of, of Soweto, you're talking about people who are extremely poor. Average household income is about a thousand rands a month. Traffic in Soweto on a Saturday morning is very, very busy uh, because you have lots of funerals. Number one reason is the HIV AIDS pandemic. Lots of young people are dying, um, mothers and fathers, and as they die, they're, off, they're leaving children behind and no one's looking after the children. They say by 2010, there'll be three million orphans in South Africa. And I think the number is going to be much higher. If somebody told me six months before I was going to move to South Africa and live there, I'd tell them they were crazy. I was living in Washington, D.C., had a very comfortable job. In 93, delegations from South Africa came over to talk to people to see how we Americans did things as they were preparing for their new democracy. And because of the job I had in the mayor's office, um, uh, I met with them and facilitated them getting answers to the to the questions they, they, they raised. And they kept insisting I should come to South Africa. I worked in the four poorest provinces in the country uh, where schools didn't have classrooms. They taught under trees. Um, and kids who were a little older, um, high school age level, um, were basically persuaded to not continue with education but get a job to help feed the family. Coming to Soweto, um, and looking at the poverty, it was easy to come here. The need was here. I felt that the kids who lived in shacks and back rooms were the ones who needed the most help. I saw the cycle of, of poverty continuing. So after five years of working in the country, I wanted to just help one learner, one, one student. So when I did the budget and found out how much it cost uh, to, to educate a high school kid in the township, I looked at my budget and my finances and decided I was going to help five kids out of my own pocket. The number quickly grew to 17. Because I made a commitment to these kids, and because for the first time they started to trust somebody, to open up to somebody, I couldn't abandon them and reject them, so I dug deeper in my own pockets. I almost lost my house a couple of times because I would rather pay for school shoes and textbooks and school trips rather than pay my mortgage. You need school shoes? What size? Size 5. Size 5? And most people from the community, from Soweto, who can help us, they don't have time for us. He taught me something in life, that uh, you need to love, you need to help. You can only help by money, but give time to people, as he has done to me. I never knew my father, but he became a father to me. I never had somebody that I can trust, that I can talk to, but he came and I was able to talk to him, you know. And he showed me love, which is something that I never experienced before. And uh, for that, I think I'll always be thankful. I never knew my mother because she passed away when I was uh, probably five years. Last year I just um, lost my father, he passed away, so I'm staying alone. 
I had quite a low self-esteem. But then when I came into the program in the trust, I, I, I learned about how to be proactive. I learned about how to be uh, assertive. Therefore, those things helped me even today to to stand for myself, to to know what 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 I have to say, not to have fear when I'm uh, when I'm talking to anyone. Anyway, to to actually have that confidence within me. Zappo, you guys welcome home. I want to see you moving. Move. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Walk, walk the girls home. I pay um, taxi drivers to transport the kids to and from school. When I'm here on Saturdays, I personally drive the girls home. And the reason why I do that is because I don't want to have to get a phone call that they've been raped. The value of life for girls and women are not respected by some of the boys and the men in the community. And to be proactive, rather than have any girl harmed, try to make a way to make sure they get home safely. June 16, 1976, uh, students were told they had to be taught all of their subjects in Afrikaans, and the students basically said no, they wanted to protest, they came into the streets, they left all the various schools around Soweto. The first kid to be shot by the police, it happened right here, Hector Peterson. And there's a picture that was shown all over the world the following day of this kid dead being carried by a bigger kid. Mandela in 92 had the tombstone erected with the ANC Youth League to pay honor and tribute to the struggle and the young people who gave their lives for, for democracy, for freedom. Whew. I get very hurt. I get very sad. And I get frustrated because these people who died and those who survived are in their 40s and um, are neglecting the least of the flock, uh, the children who have been orphaned and vulnerable because of HIV AIDS. I got a wonderful job offered to go back to the States, Washington, D.C. But I thought about these kids and all the things that I've said to them. And if I left, what would happen to them? So that was another way of God telling me I'm stuck here. And uh, I don't mind it at all because I love each and every one of them. There's no glass ceiling here. When an African American comes to Africa, they can no longer hide behind their color because everyone almost is the same color that they are. They must now reach inside their inner self and pull out the best in themselves. You want to say hi? Say hello? Say bye-bye? Imagine affirmative action with teeth. And imagine affirmative action with the government uh, backing it wholeheartedly and, and being at the top of the agenda versus um, okay, you know, here's a set aside. It's not a set aside. It, it's it's a, a mandated transformation of the economy, and that's what's going on here. So there are more black people who are sharing in wealth creation opportunities, so that the, the the deployment of wealth of capital is spread throughout the society in many facets. Just South African. Yes. Yeah. I come from a pretty fast-paced environment in former New York City, and I worked in Wall Street. Uh, for about four years in Wall Street, the kind of approach is, listen, do this, do this now, and if you're not going to do it, we have 200 people waiting in line to do it. In South Africa, it's a bit different. An employee's rights are much more protected than in the United States. So you have to, uh, you have to adjust to that. You have to become a better person um, to be effective, uh, to manage well. We've been up and running for about uh, be four years come um, this June. At this point in time, we'll be managing, or are managing, over a billion rand. 
um, which I think is, is a significant feat for a young company. It, it amounts to uh, about 100, 160, 100, 170 uh, million dollars. You know, and, and again, in, in South African terms, it's a significant amount. This is uh, Cora Fernandez, who is working on the private equity side of the business, and Yolanda Inklapo, also in private equity, part of the team, and, and Renee Scudder, also in private equity. So, <laughs> as you can see, there's a uh, uh, a gender preference uh, team of private equity professionals here. Didn't, didn't uh, wasn't by uh, by design, but it, it's worked out. And it's worked out very well. I'm 41 years old, and I've been living in in South Africa now for going on 10 years. And during my lifetime, the two happiest moments of my life I experienced in South Africa. The first one was was the day I got married. And then the one that superseded that was the day that we had our, our child born. So um, it's interesting when you, when you look at your life and you say, well, I'm an American. I've been in, uh, lived most of my life in America, born and raised, that you relate the happiest moments of your life in, in another country. The hospitals and, and even the primary care uh, and clinics in South Africa are some of the best, I believe, uh, that are available in, in, in the world. There are roughly 44 million people in South Africa and there are roughly 7 million families that have private insurance in South Africa. So you can see that the proportion is slightly below 20% of the population that's currently with private insurance coverage. Our company is a managed healthcare company. We are the uh, company that is called when a patient is to be admitted into the hospital for an elective surgery. Our nursing staff and uh, medical advisors determine whether the admission is necessary and appropriate. As my wife uh, would say, when we came, we visited South Africa, we saw there was an enormous opportunity to do something great here, uh, something that would be very difficult to accomplish uh, in the States. Um, we could actually build the infrastructure from the ground up here, which is something that we never tried in the States. I'm a capitalist. I'm truly here for the purpose of making a good business. On the other hand, we want to do some good at the same time. And I think that's a realistic approach. And I think anybody that comes here for, you know, in business for any other reason, one would have to question what they're here for. I think that it's probably more difficult to capitalize your business here than it, particularly if you are not South African. If we were South African and black South Africans, we would have uh, many more venues or, uh, available for us uh, to capitalize our company. You'll probably find that most black Americans that do business over here violated that basic, the very basic, that very basic adage that we're always uh, trained in business 101, and that is never invest your own money. They've all invested their own money over here. And the advantage to us has been that our money is, is worth six times more than the brand, and it allows us to, to do more with it if you have dollars available. It won't be feasible for us to. Okay, now you have seen the first half of the movie um, or the documentary. What do you think? I mean, I think I think Stafford was dead on. I'm sure he was motivated just like me to put out good t content, to put out relevant content and to be able to tell our story in our entirety. And we I really appreciated it when I saw it. And I'm sure you are appreciating that same thing right now. So, again, make sure that you share with everyone. And of course, this channel here, there's plenty of content. Um, that you can go back and look at. There's stuff that we did some time ago, which is still relevant, and there are things that we have that, that we already have that we've done last week. And then, of course, there's going to be more content. So I would suggest that you go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel. And like I said, this is a grassroots movement for um, those that are in the diaspora who are African that are living off the continent to have the opportunity to come to South Africa or Africa in general. So if you have any comments, of course, leave them in the bottom. We'll be more than happy. I read them. I read them all. Uh, I appreciate you. And uh, of course, look forward to the second edition of this video. 
Hello everyone, this is Mark Blanton from The Real South Africa and I just want you guys to know that we have wonderful trips specifically designed for us to come to South Africa and enjoy all of this. Um, we're the only company in South Africa and probably in the world that's, that's marketing directly to the African American community and the diaspora. So we would love for you guys to go to our website, The Real South Africa. We would love for you to go to our YouTube channel to get more information. Um, just go to YouTube put in the real South Africa and you'll see some of our videos, but we would love to have you here and the South Africans would love to have you here as well. So go ahead and book your trips today and visit the real South Africa.